And on that note, it's now my very great pleasure to introduce our first and very special guest. Uh, progressive Australia really tries to seek out the shining stars in the international progressive family, and I am very excited about having Buffy Wicks here with us today. As National Director of Operation Vote for the Obama for America campaign, Buffy mobilised hundreds of thousands of voters, including African Americans, Latinos, young uh, people and women, to turn out and vote for Obama. She then served as the Deputy Director of the White House Office of Public Engagement for President Obama, playing an important role in support of healthcare reform and financial regulation. She's currently a senior fellow at the Centre for American Progress. Now, I had the pleasure of sharing a meal with Buffy last night, and I know that she intends to share with us today a wealth of insight from her period at the Obama campaign. I've also encouraged her to share with us her passion for women's issues and women's organising, and I know that that will be very welcome here at this time. After she finishes, there will be plenty of time for questions, but now can I ask you to very warmly welcome Buffy Wicks. I come from community organizing, and in the States, uh, in the labor movement, uh, in the um, organizers movement, we have something called the organizer clap. Do you all do this here? Do you know what this is? Okay, we're gonna learn together. Um, you're gonna follow me, and, and basically, um, this is how you kick off every meeting um, in the labor, labor movement in the United States. And it's really simple, you, you, it's a clap, and you start off slow and you build momentum, and the point being that if we all act in unison, we can be a force to be reckoned with. So, you're gonna follow me, and we're gonna start off really slow, and we're gonna go faster, it's very simple. You ready? We're gonna, you guys can do this. We're going to try that one more time. <laughs> so follow me. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much. Good job. Uh, I, I like to start off meetings that way uh, to get the energy going. Um, so I have a presentation that I'm going to talk through here. But first, I want to just talk to you a little bit about why I ended up uh, in the Obama campaign and why I ended up working for the president for six years. Um, because I was very deeply, personally motivated to do that work, and I, I know many of you are motivated to do this work for very deeply personal reasons. So I just want to share with you my story. In 2003, I was, which I sort of refer to in the US as sort of the dark uh, era of progressive politics. Um, it was a very challenging time for us then. We were um, in the midst of the Bush administration. Uh, and I was organizing in the anti-war movement in San Francisco. And I was leading all of the large protests and demonstrations that were go on, going on, knowing that chances were we were going to go to war in Iraq, but I wanted to make sure that there were people that knew that not everyone agreed with that um, and that we could voice that out to the international community. And I was driving to work one day, and a really good friend of mine, a guy named Tom, called me and said, I just tested positive with HIV. Can you come pick me up from the clinic? And when you get this diagnosis, they don't allow you to go off by yourself. They have you come, have someone come get you. So I went there to this clinic in the Mission District in San Francisco, and we sat down with the nurse. And I learned about T cell counts and viral loads and things that I didn't know that much about. And we left the office, and we're sitting in my car, and I remember it was um, a blue skies, a little bit of clouds, and he turned to me and he said, I don't have any health insurance. And in that dark moment of his life, he was worried about his insurance as opposed to his health. And he now would be considered a pre-existing condition, meaning that companies, healthcare companies in the US could legally discriminate against him and not provide him coverage. And this was the week that we started dropping bombs in Iraq. And I got really angry at the direction the country was going. This is arguably uh, the most wealthiest country in the world. And yet, our public policy um, reflected values that were not mine. And this sent me on a trajectory to get much more involved 
in electoral politics. And I decided that I wanted to be as close to the decision-making table as possible in my country when we decided where our resources were going. Shortly thereafter, I met uh, State Senator Barack Obama in 2004, who was running for the uh, Democratic primary in, uh, for the US Senate seat in Illinois. And I followed his short rise to national stardom and realized that I needed to go work for this man because he had the same values that I have. He didn't agree with the war in Iraq and he fundamentally supported a complete overhaul to our health reform system in the United States. So I got on that campaign early in 2007 when we were 30 points down and Hillary Clinton was the presumptive nominee. And I moved to Chicago uh, and I was one of the first people hired on and helped to develop our national community-based organizing field strategy. And we knew that we needed to do it differently. We knew that we needed to go directly to the people and engage them in a real conversation about the direction this country was going in. So I helped to build out our national field organizing strategy and I did my tour of duty. I was all over the country. And when we won, I had the honor and privilege of being an appointee by the president to work in the White House as the deputy director of the Office of Public Engagement, handling all of the uh, relationships with the outside advocacy organizations. And I got to work on health reform. And that's what I spent the first year and a half at the White House doing. And I'll never forget, on a Sunday evening in March 2010, sitting in the Roosevelt Room with the President of the United States, watching the health care votes come in, one by one. We were watching them on C-SPAN. And when that last vote came in, and we passed what would be the most comprehensive health reform legislation in decades, I looked around the room and I saw the president and the vice president and David Axelrod and Rahm Emanuel. And I realized that 10 years ago, this is what I started working for. And here we are 10 years later, and this was the change that we had all been seeking. And while it took a long time, we finally got there. And I don't tell you this story because it's unique. I think it's actually very common. It's common that all of us are motivated by deeply personal reasons to do the work that we do. And all of us have the ability to make the change that we want to seek. So I know that there's been some challenges uh, in the Labor Party as of late, but don't forget what drives you in this work. You all could be doing a million other things, but you're here for a reason, and it's because you care about the, country, the future of this country. And don't give up on that. Um, because I do believe that all of you have the power to make the change that you want so badly in this country. So as you listen to this presentation and others over the course of this weekend, please keep that in mind. And I hope that some of the stuff that I'm going to be presenting here will be helpful. Although I'm not arrogant enough to think that this is all totally applicable. Um, I come from a very different country, but hopefully you can glean some lessons on some of the things that we did um, in the 2012 cycle for the Obama campaign. So with that, I want to talk through uh, how we won and ran the most um, aggressive campaign in US history. Do I have the clicker? I do. Great. OK. So. Uh, first, I want to give a little bit of um, context. <laughs> Button on the side. That's the volume. Um, I don't know that that's working. There we go. Great. Thank you. So, um, first, I want to... Um, talk through a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. And if I talk too fast, please let me know. I tend to do that. Um, we're just going to briefly go over um, a couple core things throughout the course of this presentation uh, in how you win and build a progressive movement. One, you need a message that fundamentally moves voters and that is authentic. Voters can tell 
when someone's not being authentic. So that is incredibly important. Um, and I, I think of messages in two different ways. There's the proactive, aspirational, positive message that lays out your vision or your candidate's vision. And then there's holding the opponent accountable, uh, which we did a lot of uh, in the Obama campaign and making sure that we really defined who Mitt Romney was. And we went out early doing that, and we did it every single day over the course of the 18-month slog that was uh, the re-election campaign effort. Secondly is the investment of resources. It's time to put your money where your mouth is. And in the Obama world, we invested significant res uh, resources in all of our battleground state uh, operations, and I'll talk through that in a little bit, um, as well as digital tools, paid media, and organizing. Now, the last is organizing, which is my specialty. So I'm gonna talk probably a little bit more about that in terms of the organization that we built. There's um, sort of an untold story, I think, in the Obama world. Uh, when I started on in early 2007, there was a handful of us trying to figure out how do you organize this country, how do you do it with limited resources. Um, and we had all these different models of organizing going on all over the country. And it was really sort of like a petri dish of organizing. We had some states that were doing a precinct captain model, some states that were doing a neighborhood team model, some states were doing paid canvassing, all different kinds of stuff. And we learned a lot in those early days in 2007 and 2008 to finally uh, perfect the model that we ended up using in the re-election, which was the team model, which I'll talk about um, here today. Although I will say it's the model that was preferred for us, but there are different models of organizing depending on the communities in which you are in. So I want to give a little bit of context first. I think folks tend to think that, oh, well, you know, he was the president and of course we were going to win the re-election campaign effort. Uh, 2012 was very different than 2008. Um, as many of you remember, uh, our economy basically collapsed at the end of 2008 and that was a lot of what we were dealing with in 2009 and in 2010. Um, the housing market completely collapsed, people were underwater, many people lost their job. The foundation of the American dream was in question for a lot of people, and that made voters very anxious and very nervous um, heading into the re-election effort. In addition to this, uh, we got our clock cleaned uh, pretty nicely uh, during the midterm elections in 2010. The Republicans, led by the Tea Party, which was, I think, at its apex then, um, completely took over the House of Representatives for us. We held on to the Senate, but the House was gone, effectively. And at the state level, the Republicans took over uh, a lot of the state legislatures um, and governorships across the country. And this was a big um, eye-opening moment for us in terms of realizing that 2012 was going to be fundamentally very different than 2008. In addition to this, um, we saw widespread attempts, and I believe a very coordinated attempt by the other side, um, to reel back um, access to voting. Uh, in our country. So there was legislation in many states that was passed, there was laws that were passed that effectively got rid of early voting. Early voting often is a week or two weeks before election day you can go in and vote. It's incredibly important for folks who have more than one job, who are juggling a lot, it gives them more time to go vote. Um, there was incredibly strict le legislation in terms of doing voter registration, uh, which was a really important part of our uh, strategic priorities on the campaign. For instance, in Florida, if you were a volunteer and you went into the county clerk's office to pick up 10 voter registration forms because you wanted to go back to your dorm room and register your friends, you had to return those forms within 48 hours or you could go to jail. Now, it's really hard to organize volunteers within that context, and you never want to, of course, put them in harm's way, and what happens if you lose a form or you misplace one? We eventually got that law overturned, but um, this was a big issue on the campaign and making sure that we protected the rights of people, regardless of political party, to be able to go and vote. Um, and this was one of the, I think, a strategic effort um, by, the end, by the other side to diminish um, and reduce turnout um, for the 2012 campaign. And so we had to fight this legally, we had to fight this politically, we had to fight this in the press, we had to out-organize around it, you know, every tool in the toolbox. We had to educate voters, we didn't also, you know, we didn't want to use scare tactics tactics, so we had to be honest and truthful about how we spoke about this. Um, but it was definitely a big challenge, and we had a lot of resources that were um, devoted to this. 
Now, heading into um, in the early parts of the campaign in 2011, um, we realized that we had many pathways to victory. We knew that we needed to get 270 electoral votes. I could spend half a day on the electoral process, but I'll spare you the details. <laughs> um, it is incredibly complicated and um, an odd system, but it's what we have in the states. And basically, you need to get 270 electoral votes to win. Um, and so we knew that we had many different pathways, that there wasn't going to be one way that we win this campaign. Um, that we could, you know, 227 was our base line, that's what John Kerry got, we knew that we would get that, but then how do we get to the 270 um, magic number? And there were different ways we could do it. We could do a small state path with a, a win in Pennsylvania, Colorado, Nevada, Iowa, New Hampshire, that would have given us 272. We knew that there was this sort of, you know, all of our eggs in the basket of Florida, which is always a battleground state. Um, we had a Rust Belt path, so we had a variety of different um, paths to victory um, that we could uh, pursue. Um, uh, to get to 270 electoral votes. So I want to go back now and talk about messaging that moves voters. Fundamentally, we crafted our message on four key things. The president's record uh, and what he had achieved um, as president. His character, which was incredibly important. People trust the president. It's this inherent thing that folks feel and see when they watch him speak. Um, and that was very important to us, particularly given who our opponent was. Um, the environment at the time, as I mentioned, uh, the economy was still incredibly weak at the time, and so we had to be very mindful of that. And then his vision of where he was going to take the country. So breaking that down a little bit more, um, you know, the environment, effectively we wanted to restore the lost middle class security um, that we had once had so much in our country. In terms of his record, we talked a lot about the Affordable Care Act. We talked a lot about the American Jobs Act. And uh, these were proof points as to what his values were because he was standing up for middle class voters. There were moments of opportunity where we could articulate his vision, and the best person to articulate his vision is himself. The man can deliver a speech. Uh, and so we're, we, we, we used that um, uh, to our strength many times. There was a speech in Canvas, uh, Kansas. There was the State of the Union address. Um, there was the Democratic Convention in September um, of 2012, which was a great opportunity for us to articulate that vision. And that convention also, obviously, we had Bill Clinton, who was a tremendous validator for the president. And of course, my favorite, Michelle Obama's speech, um, which was fantastic. And in terms of his character, uh, we did a lot of message research on this. Fundamentally, Americans think the president is honest and trustworthy. Um, they think that he really does try to do what is best. They think of him as positive and optimistic. They think of him as a family man. Um, some of the best shareable graphics on Facebook that we had were ones of him and Michelle with Bo the dog. You know, those types of images um, made him very real and approachable for people. And just on the character component, um, a big reason why voters um, really appreciated his character was because of his own personal story and how he was willing to articulate that. Um, and that started in the 2004 DNC convention speech that many of you probably remember. But just the story of who he was and that he, his family came from you know, immigrants and you know, the issues that he was dealing with as a young man, as a person of color, and the fact that he was able to talk about these things. Americans really related to this. So we really use personal narrative as a way to express values, both of him and his vision but also for all of our staff, we actually trained our organizers on what we call story of self, to express your values through your own personal story. And it's incredibly impactful because you don't have a debate all day long about healthcare policy, because we could do that forever. You talk about why healthcare matters to you because of your friend Tom, right? And no one can take that away from you. So that was a really important component of um, how we trained our organizers on how to articulate themselves in settings all across the country. And we actually really learned that from the president. And if you look at his 2004 convention speech, he does it uh, beautifully. So I want to show, um, I've got two ads here. One is an ad of the president speaking direct to camera, laying out sort of where the country is and his vision and his plan. And this will give you a good sense of how we communicated his message. There's just no quit in America, and you're seeing that right now. Over 5 million new jobs, exports up 41%, home values rising, 
our auto industry back, and our heroes are coming home. We're not there yet, but we've made real progress, and the last thing we should do is turn back now. Here's my plan for the next four years. Making education and training a national priority. Building on our manufacturing boom. Boosting American-made energy. Reducing the deficits responsibly by cutting where we can and asking the wealthy to pay a little more. And ending the war in Afghanistan so we can do some nation building here at home. That's the right path. So read my plan, compare it to Governor Romney's, and decide which is better for you. It's an honor to be your president, and I'm asking for your vote. So together, we can keep moving America forward. I'm Barack Obama, and I approve this message. So you can see we really framed this election as, do we want to go back to what we had before in terms of our economic policy, or do we want to continue doing what we're doing and move the country forward? And he, you know, in that um, ad, he said, we're not exactly where we need to be, but we're headed in the right direction. And it was important for us to give a nod to that because many Americans still you know, weren't getting the jobs that they had once had. Many Americans still had lost their retirement in the economic collapse or weren't in homes yet. But we wanted to make sure we still gave a sense of hope um, and aspiration as we moved into November of, um, of the election. And the next slide I'm gonna show you is um, Mitt Romney's, uh, in his own words, and this was a contrast spot that we did, um, and really all we needed was his own words to show the difference between the president's and his vision and what Mitt Romney believes. And those of you may remember, he made a comment at a fundraiser in Boca Raton about the 47% of Americans that are victims, you know, that want entitlement programs. This was incredibly offensive to many Americans in this country. Um, so we effectively, again, used his own words to highlight who he was as a person. I'm Barack Obama, and I approve this message. There are 47% of the people who vote for the president no matter what, who are dependent upon government, who believe that, that they are victims, who believe that government has a responsibility to care for them, who believe that they're entitled to health care, to food, to housing, to you name it. And they will vote for this president no matter what. And so my job is not to worry about those people. I'll never convince them that they should take personal responsibility and care for their lives. So he made it fairly easy for us to <laughs> demonstrate the contrast between the two candidates. Um, and, and I'll show you here in a second at the end of this some of the polling and what happened when that comment um, was made. And it really was a moment where he was just sort of speaking off the cuff about his own views. Um, so as you can see, there's a clear difference in the two candidates. And the messaging around how we built that was incredibly important um, as we moved forward in that campaign. So. Um, these were the three core programs, and I'm not going to spend too much time talking about registration and turnout because I know that um, you all have compulsory voting here, so it's a little bit of a different equation. But I do want to mention them briefly. On voter registration, this was crucial to the success of our campaign because we actually literally changed the um, makeup of the electorate fundamentally, by all the voter registration efforts that we did. We collected 1.8 million voter registration forms, um, 1.7 alone in 2012, which was very important to um, the turnout of, of a lot of our key um, voters. And in fact, um, in five states, the forms we collected exceeded the margin of victory. So had we not done voter registration, who knows what the outcome would have been in those five states. And I, the reason why, I, and again, I know it's not as applicable here, but this also demonstrates the organizational capacity that we built up um, across the country. Those are all volunteers that did that, that collected those 1.8 million forms. And generally speaking, one volunteer goes out for about a two to three hour shift, and they get about two to three voter registration forms per shift. So it's about one per hour. So we built an organization that had 1.8 million uh, volunteer hours devoted to doing voter registration. Um, I'll come back to persuasion on turnout. Um, a, a, another key part of um, the victory of our campaign was really educating and turning out what we call sporadic voters. Those are voters who maybe they voted in 2008, but they haven't voted since. So they need to be reminded. So we would gently remind them by literally going to their house and taking them to the polls. <laughs> um, or calling them every single day for a month prior to election day. 
um, which is what we needed to do to get them to turn out and vote. Uh, and we ended up having um, over 5,000 uh, GOTV locations around the country, which were basically people opened up their garage, and for their little neighborhood turf, that was the GOTV location, and we would deploy uh, volunteers to go around the neighborhood to get people to turn out and vote. So um, those were the, th and, sorry, now persuasion, which is the one that actually I think matters the most for you guys. Um, we basically did about 150 million phone calls and door knocks, mostly focused on persuasion, uh, where we were hitting um, doors of folks that we knew from our analytics and data that were persuadable donor, or persuadable voters. And persuadable voters tend to be voters who, they vote very reliably, but they decide very late. So they need a personal touch. And in the most ideal world, um, they would have a personal touch from the president. Now, that's very difficult to do. Um, so barring that, we actually would um, do organizing through folks' social networks to try to get friends to tell friends. Because your friends are your friends for a reason, right? You, tr you trust their judgment. So really trying to get into those networks and have friends tell friends to vote and why it's important and what their personal story is. That's why um, we do the personal story uh, work on the campaign. Um, we ended up... Um, having about 800 offices around the country and 2,700 organizers, and I'll talk through that um, here in a second. So, um, we ended up with uh, 631 offices in our battleground states. We had about, a, depending on the day of the week, 12 to 13 battleground states that we were focused on that were gonna be our key swing states that we needed to invest um, most of our resources. There was no reason to invest resources in a place like California. We knew that it would be blue. We knew that it was gonna be Democratic. We knew that Mississippi was gonna be red, that it was gonna go for Mitt Romney. So given that you only have so many resources, we wanted to make sure we um, spent those resources effectively. So most of our states were in um, uh, our battleground states. And uh, again, we ended up having about 5,000 in the end of these sort of hyper-local um, staging locations. And about 80% of our volunteers lived within 10 miles of a local campaign office. We fundamentally believed that we should have a presence in these communities. Uh, and we fundamentally believed that the people that worked in those offices, the volunteers, they represented the President of the United States every single day. They had the keys to the car and they were driving. Um, and so we really wanted to make sure they were empowered in the work that they were doing. So um, we invested in um, about 10 states. We knew that if we won Wisconsin, Nevada, Iowa, New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, and Colorado, we would get over the 270 mark that we needed. We could have effectively lost Virginia, Ohio, Florida, and North Carolina, and still won, which is pretty remarkable because usually the sort of common thought is that you have to win Ohio or Florida. Um, but because we had so many different pathways to victory, we had many different options, which was good. Obviously, we ended up winning Virginia, Ohio, and Florida. Um, so uh, it was, we ended up with uh, 332 electoral votes, which that number 332 is actually incorporated into all of my passwords now. Um, so if you can figure out the rest of it, you know how to get into my, um, my email account. <laughs> Um, and the border states were really, really important. We had um, New York um, sending volunteers into New Hampshire. Uh, we had, and, and, and to Pennsylvania. We had Boston, uh, Massachusetts sending in volunteers. We had California sending in volunteers to, um, to Nevada. We had Chicago sending volunteers into Iowa. Really leveraging all of the resources that we had on this campaign to communicate and to do those 1.5 million um, calls and knocks that we needed. So a little bit about um, our grassroots efforts, which we're all very incredibly um, proud of. And while the campaign started in 2011, we actually never stopped organizing the moment we started the campaign in 2007. So 2007 and 2008 came and went. And part of the philosophy was um, we really wanted to create lasting infrastructure that actually had nothing to do with the president. We wanted to create organizers in these communities so that if a local river was polluted or a school was facing funding cuts, these community groups could organize around it, right? And to really be agents of change in their community. Thankfully, we did that, and what that resulted in then was this long-lasting grassroots organization that still exists now. It then was housed over at the DNC, where um, in 2009 and 10, um, our grassroots organizations really worked to help pass health reform and many of the other legislative priorities. So when we started again in 2011, we already, we already had a good solid group of supporters, activists, and folks who had gone through many trainings. They knew what they were doing. They knew how to use the voter file. They knew how 
to organize campuses and phone banks. Um, they didn't require that much more training. So we had a good core group. So we had about uh, 2,700 field organizers that were paid staff in our 11 battleground states who all had a specific turf um, about eight to 12 precincts um, per uh, neighborhood turf, and they would have about four or five of those, um, each organizer would. They would then recruit uh, 10,000 team leaders, and these were folks who would work 20, 30, 40 hours a week on the campaign. Um, they were the, the people that, if I called them at 11 o'clock at night and said, can you bring 30 more...